Welcome back, WNST, Towson, Baltimore, and Baltimore Positive. Yes, I am wearing my Chicken Palooza gear. Giddy up. Uh, it is uh, Chicken Palooza, but it's also Maryland Crab Cake Tour time. We're going to be getting beginning next week, Maryland Crab Cake Tour. Uh, you know, I'm not going to give it all away, but we're going to kick things off at Conrad's next Monday at the Seafood Market right here in Towson, near the radio station, uh, right near Dr. Steve's office as well on Joppa, uh, between Lock Raven and Pairing. Uh, we'll be there from 2 until 5, talking uh, crabs, crabbing, crab cakes. Uh, and at some point, I'll be having a beer because we're doing 31 breweries. It's all brought to you by the Maryland Lottery in conjunction with our friends at Goodwill, Window Nation, and the Restaurant Association of Maryland. I tell you what, I put the Crab Cake Tour together in August. Um, I did not realize that we would have relevant Oriole baseball, which we will have. Luke Jones watched some relevant Oriole baseball over the week, and we'll have some more relevant Orioles baseball all week long before they head to Cincinnati. As uh, Earl Weaver would say, that sounds a little weird. I mean, the, the Ravens go there, but the Orioles rarely go. Is it Riverfront Stadium? Is it 1970? Uh, Luke Jones joins us now. He spent a weekend with the other nasty nester uh, at Oriole Park at Camp <laughs> Yards. Um, you know, Orioles are uh, winless against nasty nesters, I think, lifetime. And uh, certainly th th when they had a nasty nester on their team, they couldn't figure it out. How are you, man? Uh, happy weekend to you. Uh, lots and lots of people at Oriole Park over the weekend. Good to see, even if some of them happen to be Yankees fans. Yeah, no question about it. It, it was a fun weekend that, that did end with a little bit of a thud on Sunday. I mean, you get blanked by Nestor Cortez. I only get two runners in scoring position. Oh, it, it's a disappointing end to what was... I would say really entertaining weekend of baseball on you know, Friday night, a uh, tough loss. Santander hits the home run late to make it a one run game. Can't quite break through. Uh, but Saturday night, one of the games of the year, you know, you come back against Garrett Cole, you make some great plays in, uh, in the field, some base running, you know, some timely hitting Ramon Urias gives you the big home run late to, to kind of seal it, give you some breathing room that you ended up needing in the ninth. Every but, night there's a different star. That's the magic uh, of Oriole baseball. There is. It, it's amazing. You look at this team right now offensively. You've got a number of guys that are having kind of, if you look at it, uh, adjusting for the fact that offense is, a down, is down around baseball in general, I guess other than Aaron Judge, right? <laughs> but, you know, they, they have a ton of guys that are having an average to slightly above average year at the plate when you kind of look at it from a, a league-adjusted standpoint, but no one having that great season. I mean, Austin Hayes has really tailed off over the last month after, you know, we were talking about him at this time, you know, a month ago, six weeks ago, maybe being an all-star. Uh, so he's tailed off, you know, been a little bit uh, banged up as well. But you go down the list, Trey Mancini uh, had a, a rough weekend at the plate. You know, Mount Castle. Uh, hasn't it's not that he hasn't hit, but he hasn't hit for as much power uh, of late. Hasn't hit a home run here uh, of late. So you go down the list. Adley Rutschman's really heated up, but you know you need a couple more guys uh, at the plate to to really get going. And you know on Sunday it kind of came to a head. Nestor Cortez, who uh, as you mentioned, has had a, a fantastic year. You know I mean a Cinderella story. This guy was a Rule Five pick that. The Orioles didn't want. Uh, I mean, the Yankees clearly didn't want him. He wouldn't well, have... Let's talk about this a little bit because, you know, it's not often that I get a, a nasty Nestor reference here and the Yankees come in and, um, you know, he's of all star caliber. You were here when his ERA was 14 or infinity for about a minute and a half, right? And these rule five guys and what the Orioles have tried to do over the last five years, which is just get breathing something like quad a major league pitching somewhere in he's an interesting guy because every year during the duquette dumpster dive era right they were always trying to do this with every ryan flaherty every everybody right um and and shipping guys back they didn't ship a lot of guys back right i mean a lot of these guys sort of stuck around until they stuck around if they didn't stick around because you bring them up where are you going to, you can't hide him. And why would you want to hide him when you're going to lose 112 games anyway? You know, I just, to see a guy blossom like that, that you had in your own Jersey at some point, it's a little disappointing. I mean, certainly to give him back to the Yankees, even more than that. Right. I mean, I guess it can be, but go look at his numbers. I mean, he well, was terrible he, with the yeah, Orioles. He, yeah, he, he couldn't he, say, right. Keep in mind, keep in mind, he went back to the Yankees and then he, Went to Seattle. I mean, this is not a guy who just was with the Orioles five minutes, came back to the Yankees and was then great. And then you're saying, oh, wow, the Orioles really messed this up. I mean, this is a guy that go look at his number seven, seven, one ERA with the Orioles, albeit, you know, it was a few innings. Uh, I mean, he, he just he didn't show anything to 
to make you really think, oh, wow, this guy is something. Goes back to the Yankees, you know, pitched out of the bullpen, had a five and a half ERA in 19. Goes to Seattle, you know, uh, is there for a little while, and you know, suddenly goes back to the Yankees. And last year, at, at the age of 26, which you know isn't old, but you know, it's certainly not like prospect age anymore, well, that's right? Where Arietta figured it out, right? There, there, yeah, there's a lot I'm, of guys that figure it out around there. But the, but the difference is with him and Jake Arrieta is Nestor Cortez doesn't throw hard, right? I mean, he doesn't have that stuff that makes you go, well, wow. now he's he's picked up enough deception and he's got those tricks. You know, he's got a little bit of, you know, a left-handed Louis Tion in him where you see, you know, or Johnny Cueto in him where he, you know, he's a little deceptive and, and, and gives you some different arm slots, give, gives you some different motions and wind-ups and whatnot. But what he's done da- dating back to last year has just been incredible. And you know, the, I, I mentioned he doesn't throw hard, but he's he's been able to miss bats and he's been able to get strikeouts and you know, he got strikeouts on, on Sunday. So, I mean, the Orioles, you know, they had some hits, but you know, they never really seriously threatened him uh, other than you know maybe one inning. So he, he's just that guy. And I know uh, we asked Robinson Chirino, so Orioles backup catcher after the game, you know, what makes him so good? And he just hides the ball really well. And it's something that he had to do. You know, because it was very apparent when he was in Baltimore, his first couple stints with the Yankees, you know, when he goes to Seattle for a minute that, you know, the, this guy's got to, he, he needs some tricks if he's going to make it. And sure enough, he, he's figured that out and we'll see how long it lasts. You, you do wonder, you know, will this be a three or four year type thing? Or is this guy going to be pitching for the Yankees for the next decade? I mean, time will tell, but uh, certainly the Orioles who, were able to come alive with the bats uh, as, as the game went on on Friday and Saturday. That just didn't happen for them on Sunday. You know, they had one extra base hit, two guys and runners with, with who got into scoring position, and you know, they just didn't mount much of a threat. So you know, that, that's where I said uh, a series that was really fun, uh, really entertaining the first couple of days, not as entertaining, not as fun for the Orioles on Sunday as it just kind of ended in a thud. But uh, again, Nestor Cortez has been doing that uh, to a lot of people this year, you know, hence why he, we saw him in the All-Star game uh, this past week. Uh, Luke Jones is here. He is Baltimore Luke, and you can, of course, follow him. He's going to be in uh, Owings Mills as well, as much as I have Oriole Park behind me. It is a, a purple week around here very, very soon uh, as we, uh, we have preseason football games going on this weekend on the television as well. Let's talk about the Orioles pitching a little bit here. Um, you know, Kramer. Not bad, but Aaron Judge. And you talk about the Orioles not hitting the ball well. This is what happens when a team that's playing 750 ball comes in, right? I mean, a team that's built for $250 million, a team that's built to win 105, 110 games, looks like anyway, that that would be the case. In the case of Kramer, um, not an awful outing. I mean, they fought pretty well against the Yankees over the weekend for it being as out of whack as it is financially, spiritually, where it would have been out of whack two or three months ago, where it's been out of whack for the last five years, quite frankly, even when the Yankees were a little out of whack. Um, but Aaron Judge and the really premier players, when you're talking about the Orioles don't have a star, right? Rutschman, okay, he's coming, whatever. Mullins last year, uh, Hayes for a minute, Mountcastle can hit home runs. I've Mancini's the first baseman. I'll hear all that. But when the best team in baseball comes in and you give them hell, um, and, you know, when you're close. I mean, I would say from the pitching standpoint – Close, way closer than it used to be. Closer than the Red Sox were to the Blue Jays the other night. Yeah, right, right. I mean, how about that story with the what the Red Sox have been going through of late and how they're just getting their brains bashed well, in? The week before but... the trading deadline too, it creates all sorts of mayhem for buying and selling. Right. This is no this question. Is sort of a treacherous week to be struggling or to be too good, like the Orioles right now. Right, right. I mean, and in the case of the Orioles, there's still that sense of they're much better, but. They still have a ways to go here. I, I think anyone, even the most optimistic uh, Orioles fan acknowledges that. And that's why I've said so much for me, it's really going to be this off season as far as, all right, do you, you know, is it flipping a switch or at least turning a dial? I guess I would say in terms of you're starting to improve the major league roster, but certainly you look over the course of the weekend. I, I think, yeah, you're disappointed. You lose two out of three. But uh, as you pointed out, I mean, you're talking about a Yankees team that's completely run away with the division. Uh, I mean, that's obvious. Uh, even acknowledging the last three and a half, four weeks, they had played a little more mortal uh, type baseball. Uh, you know, for, for the I mean, the Yankees uh, got swept by Houston in the doubleheader on Thursday, so they were a little ticked off coming into Baltimore. But 
you know, as far as the Orioles, I mean, you know, Wells wasn't great on Friday. Uh, you know, Lyles held on and gave them a chance on Saturday. But you know, if you heard his postgame comments, it was clear he didn't think he pitched particularly well, but got out of a couple spots where the game could have gotten away from them and didn't. And then they were able to come back against Garrett Cole. But you, know, you just look at this team right now. It's improved. The defense certainly has been massive. I mean, we've talked about Mateo at short. We've talked about the outfield defense. I mean, Ryan McKenna makes a great catch in the ninth inning on Saturday night that you know, if he doesn't make that catch on that bloop down the right field line, you know, we could be talking about the Orioles being swept uh, instead of getting that win on Saturday night. So, you know, but you, you do, you look at the rotation, it's, it's battled, it's competed. It's certainly better than it had been the last few years when you have these games where you're down seven, nothing in the second inning. And you're thinking, okay, Stevie Wilkerson, uh, is it going to be him or, uh, you know, or, or, or which position player is going to pitch the ninth inning tonight, because you're just going to go through your entire bullpen. So you know, you're not having those types of stretches anymore. And it's given them a chance that the rotation's been just good enough that the bullpen hasn't been too overworked and the bullpen's done a hell of a job this year. So you get all those elements. And as I mentioned, maybe not getting fantastic years offensively, but guys that are at least having you know, slightly above average seasons, you know, uh, that's where you get into a territory where you're hovering around 500 at this stage of the game. Now, I think what is tough, and we talked about this before the All-Star break, going into that race series down at the Trop, you had this 10-game stretch, and so far you look at it, lost two out of three to the Rays, lost two out of three to the Yankees. You know, nothing to be embarrassed about, but at the same time, as you're getting to the trade deadline and you're looking at this thing, are they going to be good enough? You know, Are they really going to be good enough to hang in that wild card race? Seriously, right? Uh, you know, To the point where... You know, not even talking as much about them being buyers uh, as much as, you know, still thinking about this from a big picture sense. And, you know, you just kind of look at, you look at where it is right now, you know, Toronto in the wild card lead, uh, Tampa Bay, Seattle, and, and then you still have Cleveland, Chicago, the Red Sox and the Orioles. So yeah, they're three and a half games out of that last spot going into pl play on Monday, but it's a lot of teams in that mix there. And that's where you do look at this thing. And I do look at the rotation as much as they battled. I still look at it and say, is that going to hold up for two and a half, you know, not two and a half, but two more months to really have them seriously in that race. That's where I'm a little more skeptical, but that said, that doesn't mean I think they're going to fall apart. doesn't mean that they can't play very compelling, still relevant baseball, mathematically speaking. And Hey, you play in the AL East by default, you have a chance to be spoiler and to really upset some teams here down the stretch and continue to play good baseball. So you know, the opportunity is going to be there. We'll see what happens here against the Rays. You know, they've, they've fared a little bit better against Tampa Bay than going down to the trop where, you know, the, the, the Rays, you know, <laughs> you wouldn't think it's a home field advantage because there's no one in the ballpark down there, but they just seem to play well there uh, as most teams do at home. But I think, you know, these next four games and then going on the road now uh, after that against not so great teams, teams that frankly, the Orioles should be able to beat and, and, and to have some success against, uh, you know, th that'll take us past the trade deadline. Again, I've never expected that there's going to be some kind of major deal that's going to, you know, qualify them as a buyer. You know, maybe you can find someone that, you know, you have uh, some eyes towards 2023 with, but at, at the same time, you know, we'll get a better idea of where this team really is. I mean, they played so, you know, they played really well over the last month, but you go back to the beginning of May, they've played solid baseball since then. So it's been quite a while, just a matter of, okay, are they ready to take the next step or is it going to be, they're going to continue, continue to hover around 500, you know, maybe move a game or two above, maybe fall back. And we saw them fall back a little bit this weekend, but overall, it's not something that I look at and say, uh, I'm terribly discouraged about, you know, you'd like, You'd like to find a way to have Aaron Judge not kill you. But then again, you're talking about a guy who's you know, maybe going to break Maris's club record for well, the Yankees. Maybe don't so. pitch to him. And that's the big thing. I mean, I struggle with this because I don't, you know, I, I understand the, the mentality of not just wanting to put guys on base because you do have other guys in that lineup who can burn you as well. But at the same time, when you see what he's doing, and and I would say even on Sunday, I mean, Kramer struck him out twice, but that hanging curve that he threw, I mean, th that's just not a 
that's not a major league starter kind that's of quality changer, of a pitch. Right? right. I mean, again, this is what I said about Kramer. Right. I mean, he right. threw what 90 pitch, whatever, five innings, you know, yeah. one it's one pitch against yeah. the Yankees, against sure. Aaron Judge. That's not going to happen necessarily against the Tigers or against maybe against the Angels because of the players they have. But you're not going to get beaten on one pitch with the Yankees. You can have a perfectly good afternoon, but they have enough guys in the middle of the lineup, and especially Judge. Get yeah. beat by him. That that's that's a little tougher to take when you lose. No question. No question about it. And believe me, I, I'll hear the arguments of pitching around him in some of those spots. No question about it. I I, I also understand the mentality and, and you know, Hyde was asked about it after the game. You know, the idea of, you know, is it tough there? Do you try to walk him? You know, it's two outs. I, you know, you understand that you don't want to put more guys on base theoretically, but at the same time, who in that lineup, despite the fact that they have other legitimate all-star hitters in, in that lineup, who do you really want to, to beat you, you know, or, or who do you not want to beat you? Aaron Judge tops the list. So again, easier said than done. I think it's, you know, I even had people in my timeline saying, well, you know, throw fastballs up and in and then breaking pitches low and away. Well, OK, if it's that simple, then why is the guy have 37 home runs? I mean, he yes, he has punished the Orioles and he's punished the Orioles specifically over these last five years. I mean, there's no doubt about that. Look at the numbers uh, in his career. And, you know, he's faced a lot of quad A and triple A pitching at the major league level against the Orioles uh, over the last five years or so. But this guy's terrific. You know, there's a reason why he's going to get an insane amount of money. And there's a reason there's a reason why there's a lot of angst, a lot, a lot of concern uh, in the Bronx as far as, you know, Yankees fans being afraid of losing this guy. He's that good. So, again, I hear it. Yeah, there's certainly some spots I'd like to see them be a little more careful and pitch around them. But, you know, th this is as, as close as it gets to Barry Bonds in today's game as far as uh, a guy that's just punishing pit, you know, absolutely punishing pitchers and the Orioles certainly, uh, you know, they, they took their licks over the weekend against Aaron judge. That's for sure. Look, Jones is here. We are talking some Orioles baseball. We'll get up on the, uh, I want to talk about the trading deadline a little bit here because we got a week out on it. We'll talk some rays later on. And obviously you're going to get yourself lost in the purple kingdom and Lamar's here and he's going to play allegedly. Uh, we're going to ask him, is he really going to play or, or are we just going through training? I, I, I I'm not, fully clear on Lamar, you know, in any way, but, and I'm not really fully clear on, on Mike Elias this week. I think they're not going to get overwhelmed for Santander or for Mancini fans seem to like it, but you know, they're a game under 500. They got eight teams in the way, right? I mean, to be up, to be the worst playoff team, maybe if they were to make it, I, I, you know, if I'm running the team, I can't think about this year. They're not winning the World Series this year, right? Like, they could create some excitement. They could play a game or two in October if they did this or did that. And, and the notion that Hall means... You, you know, the, these these Zimmerman, these guys that were a part of the rotation, two of those three aren't going to be part of the rotation down the stretch. So I don't know that they're really a contender. I don't know that they get anything back. Do you expect the deal? I, I, I sort of do because of Elias's pedigree of not having a heart, not having, a, you know, we have to keep Trey Mancini because he I can't like we need to make the team. We need to win the World Series in 2025. And I think that's all he's thinking about, not necessarily what's going on right now. It will be interesting to see how, not just for the Orioles, but how everyone plays the trading deadline. Because the days of giving your three prospects up for Trey Mancini or the bat or the arm or even if it's Garrett Cole, um, I don't know that teams want to give away their Adley Rutschmans and their DL Alls for anything. So I, I don't know where the, you know, other than financially in some way of saving a dollar or two, why they would make a deal this week. What would be the upside of that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's tough. I mean, to, to go to piggyback off your last point there, they're giving up their Rutschmans and those types, but it's for Juan Soto, right? I mean, it's for that kind of, you know, a, a generational kind of trade, which, you know, we'll see uh, if he's moved at the deadline or, or we'll see if the yeah, Nationals. Look at the Dodgers. They sent us Kramer and D, you know, like these guys yeah. and whatever. And then they didn't even give Machado money. They didn't even sign him. You know what I mean? Right. So part of this is you're going to give away the house. You better sign Soto. You better give him $400 million. You're going to deal for him. Oh, no question about that. I mean, uh, the, and it'll be fascinating to see if he's moved now or if it, does become a case where the nationals hold on to him until the off season or, you know, and I, I was even listening to, you know, a national show over the weekend. And there was even a, a thought of, you know, you acquire Soto and, and maybe it's a team, 
you know, and they use, I think they use the Dodgers as an example. Maybe it's a case where the Dodgers acquire him tr- trying to win a World Series this, you know, this year, and then they move him and, and they recoup whatever prospects they like from some other team. So, you know, it'll be interesting. But, you know, to get well, back James to the. did a lot more of that 20 years ago when they rent Mike Piazza for a week and a half. Yeah, I mean, it's. Career, right. Right. <laughs> I, I mean, generally speaking, and again, Soto is a different animal because you're talking about a 23 year old generational guy who looks like he is already on, on a path to be a Hall of Famer. That's how good he already is. And well, when there's you look a at- perfect example of the Orioles giving a kid $400 million. That's the guy, right? I mean, sure. they're going to have their own issues with Rutschman and whoever else right. their stars are. But, like, if you're going all in to win, you better have one of them. Yeah, I mean, you would think so. Although I would say at the same time, I mean, the Angels have had Mike Trout and Shohei Otani, and, well, that hasn't gotten them very far. So, I mean, it, it, it does speak to, yeah, you want to have stars, right? But at the same time, it's much more than that. And and that's where the Orioles are still in this well, kind of The big story for me is that, that Soto not wanting to be a national, right? Like, we just came five. They're, they're no longer an expansion franchise. They've been around two decades. They've won championships. They have – they're in a big city that's not playing in Cincinnati or whatever. It, it's it, it's fascinating that they can't figure that out. I mean, it's starting to feel like they're sort of a, a bruised franchise to some degree, um, not just with the fan base or whatever the Washington sports fan would be for baseball, because baseball's got problems everywhere, right, um, in regard to, to drawing and whatnot. But the fact that they brought him a Brinks truck and he said, nah, I mean, uh, that, that almost sounds Oriole-esque to some degree, nah, to the Brinks truck when you're 23. Yeah, but but at the same time, if you look at the average annual value and his age and everything, was it you know was it really that great of an offer? I know I know what the total lump sum of, of money looks like, but was it really that special of an offer where this kid couldn't say no to it? Uh, especially when he looks at the reality of where the Nats are right now. I mean, the Nats are where right now they're where the Orioles were a couple of years ago. I mean, that's well, how I mean, bad they at, are. Look right at how now. the Orioles mismanaged so, Machado, right? In, in well, yeah. To, in regard to you have this player and he's special. I mean, they're going to have to do this with Rutschman. Uh, you know, we're not long off of that. I mean, we're three years away from well, Rutschman. Uh, like, uh, gonna have to he just got caught. Or not. Well, I, I don't know if I'd say that's right around the corner just yet, but your point's taken. And look, I, I think a lot of it has to do with, you know, if you're him or the case with Machado, which, you know, the, the big, my biggest, the biggest thing that I took issue with the Orioles, was they just waited so long to deal him. I mean, the time to deal him would have been after that wild card loss to Toronto. They should have dealt him and Zach Britton at that point. If they had done that, Dan Duquette could still be running the Orioles right now, theoretically. You know, they, they could have been in a much better position and maybe only had a two or three year rebuild as opposed to what's been five years. So uh, again, See that's why the other teams handle these things is interesting because sure. we could all sit here and say, well, the Orioles screwed this up. The Orioles screwed this lots up of teams screw things up. Whatever, right. Right. Sure. And, and now I don't know how, what more you can do than offer the kid a Brinks truck. They never offered Machado the Brinks truck, right? Like if they right. brought Machado $200 million in year three, maybe, you know, maybe, I don't know, but yeah. th- th- these are the things all these franchises have. Look, the Yankees are dealing with this with their guy right now, right? Because there's the big bad wolf will be at their son. The, the thought that Trout's going to be an angel for life, right? The fact that Otani might get dealt this week, uh, right? Maybe. Right. Yeah, uh, no question about it. I mean, it, uh, I mean, look at the NBA. I mean, I, I know they're different sports, but player movement is just – it's just part of it now. It, it really is. I mean – and, and I remember talking about this and romanticizing this 20 years ago when Cal was doing his retirement tour. And, and we were talking about the fact that in 2001 that there weren't many guys that played their entire career somewhere. And it's only just changed that much more dramatically 20 years later. I mean, those guys are few and far between in any sport, let alone just talking about baseball. But to bring it back, because you asked me about the Orioles specifically, do I expect a trade? I think almost by default, you feel like there's going to be some movement. You know, it doesn't mean they're going to trade five guys. You know, it doesn't mean that, you know, that this is going to look like a fire sale or anything like that. You know, this I, is I, his week to get on the but, phone. This is Mike Elias' this, week to get on and maybe get a kid he liked in Peoria somewhere, right? Well, like, uh, there's a little bit of that. But I also just think at the same time, there's also an argument to be made here that you do need to clear the deck a little bit. And what I mean by that is, 
you know, Sunday was a perfect example of that. You know, Adley Rutschman, day game after a night game, they didn't want to have him catch, uh, which, which is smart. You know, you don't want to run this kid into the ground. You know, he's 24, but he's still a rookie, and you want to keep him fresh, and you want to keep him fresh down the stretch. So he DHs, but we know that Mancini and Mountcastle have shared the first base and DH roles, right? So you want to keep their bats in the lineup. So you put Mancini in right field, which isn't, optimal from a defensive standpoint a little bit of an well adventure. well but but then okay santander is out of the lineup then right so so you do have a log jam here and oh by the way you do have kyle stowers playing at, uh, corner outfield at triple a norfolk lots of extra base hits you'd like to get him to the majors because i would say this much i feel you know even though santander has walked a little bit more this year and you know, he's having a fine year you know he's not having a bad year by any stretch of the imagination big clutch home run on on Friday night to, to get the Orioles back in the game. But I, I, I don't think he's a guy that projects to be a piece for them when they're making the playoffs and theoretically having a chance to win the World Series in a few years. So, you know, if you can move Santander, uh, if you can move Mancini just because Trey's going to be a free agent. And look, I, th- I think Trey, he's a good soldier and he's a, a team oriented guy. But Trey also understands the business side of this. And He's not playing first base every day, so that's hurting his defensive value per se. Uh, and, you know, he, he wants to play every day. He'd like to be a first baseman. Uh, I think Trey would like to win and win now. I mean, he's 30 years old. He knows that uh, the free agent market for someone uh, that fits his profile is not a, going to warrant a monster deal. So, you know, there's, there's something to be said that, you know, you could also be doing Trey Mancini a little bit of a solid by dealing him at the deadline. Now, are you going to get a whole lot for him? No, of course not. If you deal Jordan Lyles, are you going to get a whole lot for him, uh, you know, on a deal where he's going to be a free agent pending a club option uh, for uh, what, 11 million, I guess it is, which I doubt anyone would exercise, uh, but you're not going to get a lot for him. And what does that mean for your rotation from a functionality standpoint, you know, just getting through games and being competitive. So, you know, that's where it is tough. And I do look at Santander having two more years of club control. Jorge Lopez, you know, being an all-star closer, but you look at his age, two years of club control with him. We know the volatility of relievers. And if there's one area that we've seen uh, Elias be a little more eager to deal from, it is the bullpen. Uh, so could you see, you know, a, a couple deals where, you know, maybe they trade uh, a Santander and a, a Lopez or they package Mancini and Lopez and you, know, you get some guys who might have a chance to help you in, a, in the next year or two? Sure. Uh, do I think it's going to be this mass kind of sell-off? No, because uh, to your point, you're just not going to get a whole lot for the for some of the names we mentioned. I mean, unless you're looking to deal Cedric Mullins, you're, you're just not going to get a whole lot. So, and I'm not saying the Orioles should or will do that. Uh, so I, I think that's where I look at this thing and say, okay, Jorge Lopez being 29, you know, he's a good story, but again, we know relievers. How many times have we seen guys really good for a year, they catch lightning in a bottle, and then they kind of go back to being what they had been previously in their career. So George Cheryl. Right. Ex- <laughs> I mean, exactly. I mean, if someone wants to wow me for Jorge Lopez, and when I say wow me, that doesn't mean that you're getting a, a top 20 prospect in all of baseball, but getting a piece or two that has a chance to help you, a, a guy that has a chance to be Jorge Lopez in a year or two, I, I, I'm probably willing to do that. And, and I'm looking at Felix Bautista and say, okay, he can step into my, closers role then and and, and, you know you just kind of sub 500 sort of you know 79 or 83 win team or whatever it's gonna be right right i mean you 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 still have to be looking at this from a big picture sense and again that's not me saying that i want to make trades just for the sake of making trades i don't want to trade guys to get 17 year old dominican prospects that are nothing more than lottery tickets i'm not looking to save salary at this point i'm not but if i can make a deal or two that's going to help me for the future potentially, and also give me a chance to clear the deck for getting Kyle Stowers up to, uh, up to the majors and playing right field every day. That's where I'm a little more inclined to, to move a Mancini or a Santander, maybe not both of them, but you know, I, I feel there's an argument to be made that, you know, if there's one area they have uh, 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 some strength and some depth, it's outfield. You know, if you look at what they have coming up through their system. So Long story short, yeah, I expect a deal or two. Do I think it's going to be anything that is going to rock the foundation of the franchise? Absolutely not, because whether Trey Mancini's here the last two months or not, 
he's not going to be back. I mean, I, I think it's clear. And I think Trey understands that too, that, you know, he, he's going to be somewhere else next year. So if he has a chance to go and maybe not the Mets because they got Vogelbach from the pirates, but if he has a chance to go somewhere and play in the playoffs, let the guy do that. He's been through so much. He's already 30, let him go. So from that standpoint, remember, Trey is the other part of this compared to just thinking about it from the Orioles standpoint. So I expect we'll see a a deal or two, at least by the deadline. Just don't know if it's going to be anything foundation altering for the Orioles and their rebuild. Let him go somewhere and win and get even for not winning the SB last week. Luke Jones yeah. is here. He is Baltimore Luke. You can find him, uh, Luke, at WNST.net. He'll probably be at Oriole Park most evenings and certainly be in, uh, in Owings Mills during the afternoons beginning on Wednesday as a Purple Camp begins. Still waiting on the Purple Plume of Smoke for the Lamar Jackson contract. We'll be watching that as well. Uh, you can find us out on the Maryland Crab Cake Tour presented by the Maryland Lottery in conjunction with our friends at Goodwill and Window Nation and the Restaurant Association. Of Maryland. First up next Monday, we will be at Conrad's Seafood Market right here in Towson, right near the radio station, uh, Joppa Road and the Lock Raven. Stop down, say hello. We'll be there all afternoon on Monday. And then I have a whole litany of uh, breweries and crab cake places we're going to be. I'll be releasing that schedule a little later on in the week. I am Nestor. We are WNST AM 1570, Towson, Baltimore. And we never stop talking Baltimore positive. <laughs>